Utopia. This is going to be the last episode on The Leap before things start to get really depressing. Today we're just going to be discussing how The Leap actually played out on the ground, what the policies looked like when they were implemented, and how different sectors of society were affected by these policies, for better or for worse. The period of the Great Leap itself is too soon to decide whether or not some of the policies introduced were actually for the better. A lot of decisions made during this period ended up being reverted, if not by 1961, then certainly by 1964. However, certain concepts and ideas were introduced that were neither undone for a long time, such as the commune system, or could not be reversed once introduced, such as the idea of women working alongside men. Also something different I wanted to do in this episode. Instead of just reading off a list of things that happened in communes and also in urban areas during the leap, I wanted to give a bit of perspective on how the leap was being portrayed both within China and also in foreign language press produced in China. There were many newspapers and magazines made in China that gave a glimpse into life in the country at the time of the leap, complete with individual stories and pictures. The ones that I've chosen to look at in this episode are Peking Review and China Pictorial, both of which are available on a website called bandthought.net. The Peking Review archive on this site is incredibly useful if you need primary source material on current events in China from a Chinese perspective, especially between 1958 and 2016, but you're either not able to read Chinese or you're not very comfortable reading newspapers in Chinese. I think both of these publications, and other ones that were in Chinese like the People's Daily, give a really great insight not only into how China wanted the leap to work and be perceived to be working, but also why the rest of the world had no idea anything was going wrong at the time and for many years later. A lot of the foreigners who were running or writing for these publications were either blind to what was really happening or were so enamoured with communism that they were able to turn a blind eye to the mass scale of the tragedy in order to keep the illusion of a happy and harmonious socialist China alive. Anyway, I thought I would just include some excerpts as it's a bit more interesting than just summarising a bunch of statistics or boring academic texts. A lot of these pieces in these papers are written with genuine passion and exuberance that can only come from people who truly believed in the movement at the time. So let's start off by talking about Great Leap policies in the countryside. So if you remember from last week's episode, the mood in the central leadership was to go all in on communes in early 1958, followed by a retraction of said gung-ho spirit in late 1958, followed by a resurgence in the communization campaign in 1959. These fluctuations in central policies did impact how communization was carried out at different times, as local cadres had to react to policies coming down to them from the centre and then change their processes and systems accordingly. However, generally speaking, you can kind of trace a straight line from 1958 to 1960 that shows that communes were being built en masse and they were getting more and more centralised in their operations over that period of time. A general point to note about communes is that their ultimate goal, after however many years, was actually to eliminate the gap between rural and urban. Communes were not only to deal with agricultural tasks and side production, such as forestry, silk production and fishing, but they were also supposed to become industrial units with operations such as factories and mines, homemade chemical fertiliser plants, as well as independent financial institutions with banks and exchanges. They were also supposed to organise militia in which all of the young men were to participate, almost becoming like mini nation states almost that handled everything internally from the social to the political to the military, and they didn't need any outside support. So the aim was to become self-sufficient little communes. The actual implementation of central policies regarding how a commune should be formed and run varied from province to province and even from commune to commune. I've just picked out a couple of examples from China Pictorial in December 1958 that shows how different communes took up the challenge of improving production. So the first one, 
Communes in Pingli County, Shanxi province, where the peasants seldom engage in subsidiary production in the past, are now breeding horses, donkeys, goats, rabbits, fish, bees and tusas, introduced from Inner Mongolia, Sichuan and other places. Meanwhile, in a different commune across the country, quote, In their efforts to develop a varied economy, the People's Communes of Zixin County, Hunan province, have set up 273 new factories in a single month. The newly built factories and workshops have already produced 2.5 million gin of starch from sweet potatoes grown locally and have turned out some 500,000 farm tools. The commune's iron smelting furnaces are getting their fuel supplies from the special sidelines team that has produced over 1 million gin of charcoal in the past month. To speed up rural capital construction, the hydroelectric power station being built in the nearby river has been provided with 700,000 bamboo poles and 50,000 cubic metres of timber. So, being a topologically diverse place, different areas of China could play to their strengths when it came to enhancing production in different areas. Not every province is based on the Yangtze River and can just whip up a hydroelectric plant whenever they need to. Some places, like Shanxi province, which were a bit more barren, were more suited to raising different forms of wildlife that were used to surviving in more arid conditions. But in general, there was a sort of common practice that communes were supposed to adhere to when forming. I think the most important of these is the idea that social life in general was supposed to become communized and militarized and that people were to be organized in a way that would allow them to be mobilized to work on whatever project that they were called to work on at any moment. In some communes, the central policies were very strictly enforced in the full spirit of the law. For example, in order to comply with efforts to militarize the population and create an effective, efficient workforce, Many communes decided to attempt to dismantle the traditional family unit altogether, with husbands and wives living separately, or with multiple families living under the same roof. The idea was that by undoing the traditional patriarchal family unit, the people would be able to move towards full communism much faster as they would learn how to live together and share things as a community. This move was exacerbated by many other policies that were introduced as part of the leap. For example, some communes took to destroying peasant houses that were usually traditionally made with a type of mud and clay, and then that mud and clay was taken off as fertiliser and the peasants given a few yuan to compensate for their loss. Communal dining halls was also a very important policy. Many of these dining halls were centrally located, and this meant that people had to abandon their old villages and moved into shared accommodation in the centralised communal residences or share homes with other families whose houses hadn't been destroyed. Of course, the centralisation of food distribution also provided local cadres with a weapon with which they could combat local resistance. Those who refused to destroy their houses or comply with other policies during the leap could simply be denied access to food. Other policies that helped strengthen this idea of communal living were the introduction of communal daycares and boarding schools that further separated children from their parents, and also the creation of services, such as central sewing teams, that handled the menial tasks that women would have normally done themselves at home. Though many of these moves were unpopular, one policy stood out as not so bad in the beginning, and that was the creation of commune canteens. By the end of 1958, over 2.6 million communal dining halls had been established which, coupled with the frequent destruction of peasant homes and confiscation of private food, animals and cooking utensils, meant that between 70 and 90% of all peasants became completely reliant on the free food provided by communes during the course of the leap, with the highest rate found in Henan province at 97.8% of people. By the end of 1959, 3.9 million public dining halls had been established throughout the country, feeding 400 million people. The dining halls initially operated on a free supply basis in mid-1958, but slowly transitioned to distribution according to labour by 1960. This was mainly due to the food shortages and the resulting opposition to the principle of absolute egalitarianism that the LEAP had so heavily promoted at its launch. It's important to remember that in the context of the exaggerated reporting of the Great Leap, 
unabashed free-for-all consumption actually made complete sense. As we discussed in the last episode, 1958 reports of grain output had been grossly misleading. In July 1958, the Chinese officials announced that there was a 68% increase in the summer grain harvest, and they confidently predicted that China could produce 375 million tonnes of grain in 1958, a 92% increase over the output of 1957. This misplaced confidence, not undone until 1959, led some places to promise not just public dining halls, but also to provide basic necessities, especially to the elderly, children and cadres working at the county level. These basic necessities, which were also to be created within these self-sufficient communes, included things like clothes, soaps, medical supplies and matches. Not able to achieve the ideal distribution system because actual conditions of production had not changed at all, and in fact they had worsened, according to various studies, inefficiencies increased and productivity decreased in almost every commune in every province during the Great Leap Forward. But the introduction of the commune system did create one permanent change that, although it had some drawbacks, in the long term is probably a net positive. One of the major goals and main results of the Great Leap policies was to free women from burdensome housework and allow them to step out of the bounds of patriarchy to participate in the freedom of manual labour. As discussed at some length in an earlier episode, Mao was something of a feminist, and in general the communist cause did not discriminate between men and women, rather viewing all members of the nation as part of one community. The CCP not only believed that men and women should be equal, but that women should be given extra assistance in achieving that equality, as they had been even more oppressed by the feudal patriarchy of traditional Chinese society than their marginalised male counterparts. After taking power, the CCP put in a number of laws in place to rectify the situation, including the marriage law that we discussed in a previous episode, as well as other laws aimed at ensuring equal pay for equal work, and instituting proper maternal health care. Special provisions were also made for menstruating women and new mothers in the countryside so that, theoretically, they would not have to take part in heavy manual labour. As a result of the communal dining halls, childcare and elderly care facilities set up by communes, women were able to participate en masse in both agricultural work, as well as large-scale projects such as dam building and steel works alongside men. However, not all women were deployed equally. Young women without children were often sent with men to work on large-scale projects away from the commune or village, which usually left women with children to do the farm work. The impact of this change in general policy varied from province to province, as not all parts of China had equal views on women's work prior to communist takeover. For example, whereas in northern China in 1949, more than 80% of all women of working age were engaged in agricultural production. In Jiangsu, in eastern China, only 40% of women of working age were engaged in agricultural production. By 1959, as a result of Great Leap policies, however, 90-95% to of all Jiangsu women of working age were engaged in agricultural production. However, despite all these provisions and new expectations, The old expectations for women were not undone either naturally over time or deliberately through party intervention. In fact, the CCP actively worked to uphold traditional gender roles for women, claiming in a People's Daily article that, quote, participating in agricultural production is the right and duty of rural women. Taking care of children and dealing with housework, however, is also a responsibility that women cannot reject. This is the special way in which women and men are different. In other words, women were meant to straddle the divide of new and old China, maintaining the ideal of the new socialist family and doing essentially twice as much work for just about the same amount of recognition. In studies that feature interviews with women who lived and worked throughout the Great Leap, it's clear that there's a divide between women who had families and those who didn't, as well as women who had some power in the system, either by being a cadre or being related to one, and those who remained marginalised poor peasants at the mercy of the system. To generalise somewhat, 
For young, childless women, certain aspects of the leap truly did provide a sort of emancipation. For many women, spending time digging canals, mining for iron ore, or building dams meant that they were out from under the yoke of strict village elders and abusive families, and were able to enjoy a sort of freedom and camaraderie that they would never have been able to had they been stuck in the village doing fieldwork. Of course, not everyone enjoyed the back-breaking labour, and many women ran away from their duties during this time. But this period also provided some aspects of liberalisation that women were promised but could not otherwise obtain, such as the freedom to choose their own marriage partner and form relationships not mediated by their parents. These large-scale works that I've mentioned also took many men out of the village, often for months or even up to two years, meaning that their wives at home were also provided with a little break. With their husbands gone and the freedom to literally leave their homes, it meant that women could finally freely associate with whoever they wanted, and in general just relax a bit more, bearing in mind that many women suffered in unhappy or even abusive marriages. Women with power were not only more privileged than their counterparts, but were sometimes identified as being unusually cruel during the Great Leap period. Village women's heads, in charge of organising other women, would sometimes make them work during and after pregnancy, despite official policies, would slack off during working hours themselves, and were accused of taking advantage of their privileges when food was scarce by hoarding food for themselves and their family members. Despite the best efforts of the party, elitism and hierarchy still played a massive role in village affairs, even if the roles and titles had changed from village head and landlord to brigade leader and cadre. Women with children come across more burdened and often much less enthusiastic about having to do labour as well as care for their families. Also, as many of the married women with children would have been a bit older during the Great Leap, it's possible that many of them would also have maintained their more traditional views when it comes to work, society and relationships, even after years of communist rule. Some women interviewed noted that because of their own backwards mindsets, and sometimes that of their husbands and families, they did not join women's organisations or the Communist Youth League and were not able to get fully stuck into collective life as some of their younger, freer women were. They also discovered that the principle of equal work for equal pay was a lot harder to enforce in practice. When it came to labouring in the fields or spending all day digging for irrigation works, women generally were simply not able to keep up with the output of men and so earned fewer work points and generally less recognition for what they did. Women who already had multiple children and responsibilities at home were not impressed, but there was nothing they could do themselves to try and bring about sexual equality revolution in the countryside. Many were happy enough just getting out of the house, but any thoughts of achieving true equality with men were quickly crushed, and women resigned themselves to shouldering multiple burdens, and experiencing just a little bit of freedom on the side. Though at the time of the leap, the positive changes for women weren't always apparent or evenly distributed, I think this period can probably be thanked in some way for at least growing equality between men and women in terms of labour, especially in more traditional rural areas of China. Of course, this development has also created problems of its own. In the modern day, as men and women are now both expected to work, China has millions of migrant workers, men and women, who leave their children and parents in the countryside to go off to work in towns and cities, coming back only once or twice a year to visit, and living in poor conditions in order to send most of their money home. Though women now have equal rights, in terms of education as well, the reality is that China's rural citizens overall have fewer opportunities than their urban counterparts, and it will probably take a few more generations before women's liberation in rural China can reach its full potential. Speaking of education, a big part of the Great Leap Forward were the many new educational policies introduced both to create politically oriented socialist workers with high levels of technical skill and also to tackle widespread illiteracy. In 1949, only about 20% of the nation had received any form of education and around 90% of Chinese were functionally illiterate. Most of the educated population were concentrated in urban areas along the eastern and southern coast, and most rural areas had no educational facilities to speak of. The new policies aimed to ensure that both urban and rural children and adults 
were able to be educated in either full-time general or vocational schools or in after-work schools run by the local government or by the commune. Any ideas of having state-funded universal school systems with bourgeois-educated teachers in charge were immediately dismissed as revisionist, as well as contradictory to the idea of creating a kind of work-study system that combined practical knowledge with labour. In reality, however, it was probably just a lack of funding, as, as we mentioned before, most of the funds for the Great Leap Forward were going into industrial production. The main objective of the new educational policies was to popularise education. In the countryside, the first need was to eradicate illiteracy for both children and adults, and it was during this period that Chinese characters were simplified. According to official reports, by the end of 1958, there were around 1 million new primary schools set up, and the nation's total primary school enrolment had jumped from 64 million in 1957 to around 92 million. Such an incredible jump in numbers made possible by the fact that the majority of schools were minban, or run by the people. In the end, the total number of attendees was revised back down to 65 million, but considering that number was basically zero before 1950, this is still an impressive jump. Agricultural middle schools were set up that combined the work-study curriculum and represented the first attempt to promote mass secondary education in the countryside. Again, these schools were run by the people, who through the commune had to designate the land and teachers among themselves. They taught a mixture of agricultural production techniques along with basic maths, politics and literacy, with the aim of not only raising the quality of students, but teaching them to enjoy and appreciate work and not regard manual labour with the typical disdain of the bourgeoisie. The students practised their practical skills on land owned by the schools, the product of which was then used to pay for the expense of keeping the school open. By 1960, there was an average of one secondary school per commune. For adults, part-time schools were set up that they could attend in the low seasons, and throughout 1958, 60 million peasants were recorded taking part in classes in their spare time. Attempts were made to apply the people-run, half-work, half-study model to tertiary education, but it didn't quite stick. While many of these institutions were opened and managed to start running backyard steel furnaces and other small workshops in 1958, almost none of them made it out of the period of consolidation and economic hardship that took place in the following three years. As for pre-established colleges and universities, standards shifted in 1958 to focus on the cultivation of what was known as red and expert workers. In other words, graduates and technical experts should be just as politically oriented and dedicated to the goals of socialism as they were skilled in their professions. This policy affected the entire of academia as a whole. When it came to college admissions, political background played a much bigger role than it had in the past. Those with black backgrounds, children of former landlords, capitalists or nationalists, could be banned from attending altogether, while children from red backgrounds, poor and middle peasant families and workers, were given high preference for admission. By 1960, those with good class backgrounds made up around 35-50% to 50 of all college admissions. As these students were entering college, the curriculum was changing, often on the spot. Entire fields were reoriented to cater specifically to the goals of industrial and agricultural production. New textbooks were written collectively by party cadres and young graduates. Academics were forced to encourage greater specialisation as early as possible, skipping entire units on theory to speed up learning times and abandoning advanced degrees altogether in favour of practical experience. However, this meant that students studying scientific subjects, which was the majority of students at this point in time, could be deployed to help with construction during the Great Leap, such as on dam and irrigation projects. This meant that students were contributing to the development of the economy while also cultivating skills for their own future careers. By 1959, however, opinions on how schools should be run was already changing no doubt as part of the acknowledgement of the excesses of the early stages of the leap. In 
Full-time schools were criticised for focusing on the labour aspects of their duties too heavily and were instructed to raise the quality of teaching by strictly limiting the number of labour hours students had to undertake. Many work-study schools were amalgamated with full-time study schools, which people generally were pretty happy with, as they saw the work-study schools as a sort of mobility trap that would sentence their children to a lifetime of toil, while those who went to proper full-time schools had the opportunity to advance into higher education. But by the end of 1959, almost all forms of education had ceased, as all labour was pulled to help with the harvest and the economy floundered. True innovation in the Chinese education system would have to wait till another decade. The anti-intellectual streak of the Great Leap Forward education policies did have some interesting results. As more amateurs were encouraged to take up creative pursuits such as book and poetry writing, song composition and art, cultural production during the Great Leap flourished, contributing not only to mass culture, but also acting as a sort of rallying point for enthusiasm for the movement. Many of the works of propaganda during this period were actually created by workers and peasants themselves, as opposed to professional artists who were still employed, but were increasingly chastised for focusing on the quality of their work over quantity. High levels of cultural consumption were actively and highly encouraged. Around 45,500 books were published in 1959, 61% more than 1957, as well as tens of millions of copies of posters, comic books and paintings by peasants. Many regions and counties had to set up their own local publishing offices to handle the demand, and by 1959 there were 114 small publishing houses competing against one another to release new materials in just a few hours. The aim of raising the cultural levels of ordinary people also seems to have paid off, at least in the early days of the leap. For example, a 1958 issue of China Pictorial details the achievements of several workers who have been studying philosophy and managed to publish their works. Quote, A boiler repairman, a driver, an electrician and a job repairman, all from the mining town of Tangshan in Hobei province, are the co-authors of a vividly written and carefully reasoned editorial that appeared in Workers' Daily on December 12th, 1958, under the title Study Philosophy, Use Philosophy, Lecture on Philosophy. Since the first philosophy study group was formed by shipbuilding workers in Shanghai last June, workers throughout the country have taken to the study of philosophy en masse. In a single month, some 3,000 philosophy study groups were organised in Harbin alone, with 70,000 workers taking part. Practically all the workers at the state-owned number one cotton mill in Shanxi are studying philosophy. Workers are lecturing on philosophy too. The four authors of the Workers' Daily editorial are all worker lecturers. They lectured to government cadres, soldiers, professors and students as well as their fellow workers. One college professor remarked, The workers are really brilliant. I'm glad to be a student of theirs. Cultural production by ordinary people was heavily promoted during this period, particularly through the form of mass movements that required organised participation and the dissemination of propaganda. Two national movements of note are the New Folk Song Movement and the Peasant Mural Movement, both of which took place in 1958 and were integrated into the ideology and production goals of the Great Leap. Mao announced his intentions to revitalise folk songs for its benefits to the current aims of the regime at the Chengdu Conference in March 1958. He said, quote, All the poems that have been published are relics of the past. Why not produce some folk poems? Will every comrade on his return please be responsible for collecting folk poems? The future of Chinese poetry is folk songs first and the classics second. On this basis, we can produce a new poetry. In form, it should be like the folk song style, while in content it should combine the two opposites, realism and romanticism. What was originally intended to be a movement to just collect as many folk songs and poems as possible, by the end of April, had quickly turned into an exercise in creation. As the ideological requirements of the leap seeped into the movement, More and more poems were collected that specifically referred to the leap and the joys of labour and production. 
As for the mural movement, it was launched as a method to celebrate folk art by beautifying the villages. But again, like the new folk song movement, it was more focused on its political goals than its aesthetic ones. The majority of murals were painted on themes of socialism and the general line, developing agriculture and the results of collective production. Though the quality and execution level of the murals was not high, and in some cases could even be considered childlike, the most important thing was that they embodied the spirit of the Great Leap Forward. Unfortunately, like the high tide of the leap itself, the reality of these movements was not as glamorous as it appeared to be in newspaper publications. As the top-down nature of the movement oriented it towards the political, writers and compilers of folk songs were not free to create poems about whatever they wanted because the political imperatives restricted their freedom of expression. Focus shifted from collecting songs about daily life, festivals and family to those about labour, the relationship between the people on the party, and the general line. Books were then published about how to write and appreciate poems, as well as how poetry had become a political task. The movements were also as short-lived as the leap itself. Once the Great Leap failed, so too did the stars of the folk song movement and the mural paintings fade away. I do have some of the mural paintings collected from magazines myself, which I used in my thesis, so if I remember, I will try and put some on the website so you can see the type of thing that was being made and the kind of quality that I was talking about. So up until now, we've basically just been talking about the Great Leap in rural areas. To be honest, there's not that much discussion in academic literature about the Great Leap in cities and urban areas. Both the policies and the outcomes of the Great Leap are undoubtedly concentrated in the countryside, and urban areas were assumed to be just fine during this period, with urban populations benefiting from state-provided food, accommodation and full-time employment, as well as modern luxuries not found in the countryside. Essentially, there's not really a lot of investigation by academics on the topic of the Great Leap period, even though there's a lot of research on life, society and politics in urban areas in the 1950s in general. So for this section, it's probably more interesting to look more at the propaganda side of stuff by examining how the leap was portrayed in the media. But first, let's just give an overview of the Great Leap Forward policies in cities in general. So we know that industry was the priority during the leap. Industry benefited from a capital-intensive approach, meaning that new equipment and machinery were imported to improve the quality and output of industrial goods. Investment in state-owned units reached 38.6 billion yuan, almost twice the level of 1957, most of the money going towards larger-scale national projects. The exaggerated reports of high crop yields contributed directly to the reassessment of industrial targets, as steel production targets were revised from 6.2 million tonnes to 12 million tonnes over the course of 1958 alone. In response to the demand for higher output levels, the urban population grew by about 31 million people by 1960, with almost all of this number entitled to grain rations provided by the state. State procurement of grain rose to almost 30% of total grain output by 1959, a 30% based on inflated figures of course, which greatly contributed to the shortage of food in the countryside that we'll discuss in the next episode. It seems that there was at some point a plan to eventually introduce communes into urban areas as well, transforming the whole country into a series of small, self-contained, self-sufficient socialist units. A central party document entitled Resolution on Some Questions Concerning the People's Communes goes into some detail about this idea, and why it was taking longer to set up in cities than it was in the villages. Quote, In the future, urban people's communes, in a form suited to the specific features of the cities, will also become instruments for the transformation of old cities and the construction of new socialist cities. There are, however, certain differences between the city and the countryside. Firstly, city conditions are more complex than those in the countryside. There's no further elaboration on that, that's the whole point. Secondly, socialist ownership by the whole people is already the main form of ownership in the cities, 
and the factories, public institutions and schools under the leadership of the working class have already become highly organised in accordance with socialist principles. Thirdly, bourgeois ideology is still fairly prevalent amongst many of the capitalists and intellectuals in the cities. They still have misgivings about the establishment of communes, so we should wait for them. Consequently, we should continue to make experiments and generally should not be in a hurry to set up people's communes on a large scale. Particularly in big cities, this work should be postponed except for the necessary preparatory measures. People's communes should be established on a large scale in the cities only after rich experience has been gained and when the sceptics and doubters have been convinced. Needless to say, the doubters were never convinced. But it's still an interesting idea and it's not actually very commonly discussed. Like I said earlier, the point of rural communes was to abolish this divide between rural and urban. And so using that logic, it does make sense that urban areas would have to undergo a similar sort of transformation, even if it seems like a bit of a downgrade, I suppose, on the surface. I guess the actual purpose of communes was different for rural areas and urban areas too. Rural communes were aimed at bringing up the standard of living of peasants, whereas urban areas sought to undo the bourgeois mindsets of city dwellers and introduce a more communist style of living to people who are probably a bit more pampered and individualistic. Having said that, it seems that certain aspects of individualism were promoted as part of the LEAP strategy in urban areas. Something I always found interesting about this period is that competition was widely celebrated and encouraged, both among workers in a single factory and between different work units. It seems that the government used the celebration of certain groups competing with each other, usually referred to as emulation, to show off how the people were exceeding expectations. Despite the fact that competition seems a little bit anti-socialist, at least it does to me, but maybe I'm just being too simplistic about it. Here's an example from an article written in 1959. Quote, Inspired by the CCP's call to increase production and practice economy, Steel workers in Liaoning province challenged the coal miners and railway workers in emulation and pledged to overfulfill the annual steel production plan by 10%. The province's coal miners responded immediately and vowed to turn an extra 2 million tonnes of coal on top of the annual plan. The railway workers promised to haul all the goods to other parts of the country. Thus, an extensive emulation centering on steel production got underway. The score? Total industrial output in August was 12% higher than in July. Compared with July, daily output of steel in September was 15% higher. The focus in this article is on the targets that were exceeded, but really the message here is competition is good, so do it. Of course, the party also promotes the interrelationship between all the different competing industries. If the coal makers exceed their targets in record time, That means that steelmakers got more coal and were thus able to boost their own production. Even though the different units were technically competing in spirit, the end result was that they actually all ended up helping each other and thus benefiting the nation. So actually, now that I think about it, it was probably a smart bit of manipulation on the part of the CCP. They also encouraged the idea of individual innovation, for example, if one worker suddenly came up with a new method of producing yarn that was more efficient than a method that they'd been using before, that person could be celebrated as an individual. But the reason that they were celebrated was because they had helped the factory or the country as a whole. So even though there was this idea of individualism that was promoted in urban areas, but not in rural areas, it was still always tied back neatly into the idea of collective production and socialist work ethic. Much like in the countryside, in urban areas, women were also encouraged to go out to work. Much like their rural counterparts, they often faced hostile conditions and strenuous burdens. However, these struggles were often played off as necessary or even heroic in the media, and their stories were often used to portray yet another side of the success of the Great Leap. For example, in this article from China Pictorial in March 1959, entitled A Group of Women Set the Pace. Eleven young women decided one day that they'd had enough of the slighting references to the capabilities of women workers. 
Some of the young men in the works were the very worst offenders. Look at the time they lose, they used to say. First, they're off work to have a child, then they're off every time it falls sick. How can they do as much as men? With the encouragement of the workshop party's branch, the 11 women formed themselves into a team. When they issued a challenge to the young men in their workshop, it was at first ignored. Later, it was accepted by some of the youngest, but only in a half-hearted way. At the end of the week, however, the men found themselves in for a surprise. Each and every one of the girls had surpassed their assigned quota. As a team, they had saved 245 working hours, and this is what won them the red flag. In all, they are now turning out 350 pieces of machine parts a minute, whereas before they could make only 40 in 8 hours. As they're still fairly young, they never hesitate to ask older and more experienced workers for help. They are keen to learn, and so make rapid progress. By the continuous good work, they've managed to keep the red flag. Six of them have also won the title of advanced worker. They've earned the admiration and respect of their fellow workers, most of them men, who have to admit that the women are indeed equals of men, and sometimes even better. This rather flattering portrayal of women versus the rather dismissive nature of their male colleagues shows how the expectations of women were changing during this period, if not necessarily attitudes towards women. It's clear that the party overall wanted things to improve for women, as we discussed earlier. However, besides giving women work to do, the party wasn't exactly proactive about the changes that they wanted to see and didn't necessarily encourage changes in attitude or society either. This meant that women basically had to struggle along in their existing circumstances as wife, mother, as well as worker in this new society. Their true liberation wouldn't come until much later, and arguably, in many respects, in the modern day, it really hasn't arrived in full yet either. Something that all of these stories of urban workers have in common is that they show how most urbanites would have been blissfully unaware of the impending doom their demands on agricultural produce would wreak on their rural neighbours. For the time being, the focus was solely on exceeding expectations and taking part in all aspects of the leap, including improving their own skills and education. This often led to higher consumption, but of course they weren't to know that. By the end of 1959, however, even those protected by state-subsidised grain would come to know that something was going horribly wrong in the countryside, even if the full extent of the tragedy never fully touched them. But we will save that discussion of the disastrous outcomes of The Great Leap Forward for the next episode. As for this episode, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget that you can sign up for the Sinobabble newsletter on Substack or by going to the Sinobabble website at sinobabble.com. Something that I always forget to do is to ask you guys to just take a minute and rate this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to it on. I think it might help with algorithms and attracting new listeners, but I actually don't know how that works. Honestly, I think I just need the ego boost and the validation that you guys actually like the show. I would really appreciate that if you have a minute to do that. Also, don't forget that you can make a donation to the podcast if you want to support my work by going to sinobubble.com and clicking on the donate button. You can make a one-off donation or sign up for a monthly contract.